folks, it's undeniable that there's something about the form of a dragon that excites and compels the human mind. There's this unique, innate fascination with these mythical, legendary creatures that has led to them becoming a staple in the fantasy genre. And a really fun thing about dragons is that artists, writers and developers can play about with their forms to a near infinite degree. It's just like in the sci-fi genre with its mechs and robots and such, where we all recognise what a robot looks like, but where one robot can look very different from another robot. Well, the same is true of dragons, and indeed FromSoft are a developer which frequently feature dragons of all shapes, sizes and colours in their incredible games, several of which are similarly incredible, most of which are pretty great, and a few of which are, to be blunt, a bit shit. And so hey. I thought why not put together a list of what I consider to be the best and worst dragons from each of FromSoft's modern games, specifically Demon Souls, The Dark Souls Trilogy, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice and Elden Ring, oh Elden Ring. I would have loved to include Bloodborne too, just like I have in all my other videos in this best and worst of series, but sadly there are no dragons in that game, nor are there anything which even remotely resembles a dragon, and the same goes for Armored Core 6. Also, I will be considering things like drakes, wyverns, worms, etc too, even if they do differ a bit from the traditional form of a dragon. If you like the video, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And before I crack right on with Demon Souls, please allow me to give a massive thanks to my brilliant patrons for supporting the channel. And before that being said, let's get right into it. Now, it must be said that not all of these games have a massive selection of dragons to pick from, and that is certainly the case with the first ever Souls game, which only really features three. Mind you, for as few as there are, they're still very much worth talking about, especially my pick for best, that being the Red Dragon. Technically a wyvern, I believe, as per the fact that it only sports a pair of legs and then a set of wings, as opposed to having four legs and a set of wings, though the item description for its soul specifically describes it as a drake, so hell, I don't know. And this is going to be the first and last time I attempt to draw distinctions between drakes, dragons, wyverns and worms, or worms, because quite frankly it's all a bit messy. Regardless, the red dragon's appearance makes for a hell of a welcome to the fallen kingdom of Boataria. In fact, it's technically the very first enemy you even see in this world, carrying a mouthful of charred corpses and giving you the evil eye before flying off to be encountered again further on in the kingdom. Please do understand that by no means am I favouring the red dragon because it makes for a brilliant enemy to fight, because if I was assessing it purely on that basis, it's a certified stinker. Taking this thing down is an unengaging, drawn out and tedious affair, to the point where the method of getting rid of it feels borderline unintentional as you lose arrow after arrow or spell after spell at its soaring crimson form, but it's also a fact that taking it down is totally optional and barely even worth it anyway. You do get a soul for killing it, but it can't be transposed into any cool weapons or anything. No, no, no. What I like about the Red Dragon is how much it adds to the two levels it appears in. The first time you need to actually contend with it is at this bridge leading to the lever required to open the gate to the Phalanx boss fight, and it essentially plays out like the Hellkite Drake bridge from Dark Souls 1, except, in my opinion, way better and tighter. I finished Dark Souls 1 about 15 to 20 bloody times at this point in my life, and I still get roasted on that dumb bridge from time to time, whereas the timing here is far cleaner and clearer. But it's the second level where I really appreciate the Red Dragon. In fact, for as simple a level as it may be, I love the Lord's Path. It's kind of the closest thing these games even have to a gimmick level to be honest, but in a good way, with the gimmick being that you need to time when to run from shelter point to shelter point along this long bridge, and then descend inside the bridge at the points where the exposed areas are too long to run across without getting scorched by the dragon's flames, so did you know that you can actually dodge roll through its fire, because you can, just like this. Okay, well it didn't work there, but honestly it is possible, please believe me. What can I say? Demon Souls Red Dragon is fly as hell and significantly elevates the mechanical enjoyability of the levels it appears on. There is of course the Blue Dragon too, which appears a couple of times in the King's Tower level, 
but I prefer the way the red dragon was incorporated into the entire second level. It's really good shit. My pick for worst dragon is one that most people watching who have played Demon's Souls before probably already had in mind when they saw this video title. Of course, it is the Dragon God, appearing as the Archdemon of Stonefang Tunnel, though it's technically the very first entity you even see after starting up the game, being that enormous flying thing overshadowing the land in the intro cinematic. Now, for as much as I don't like it, let's get one thing crystal clear. The Dragon God looks exactly like a Dragon God should. The thing is absolutely enormous. The bullet is enormous, there is no escaping. Jumping is useless. For sure one of the biggest dragons of any FromSoft game, though as shown by Zoe the Witch, its size is about on par with Elder Dragon Grail from Elden Ring, and it's absolutely dwarfed by the body of Gransax. Very unconventional looking head and face too with its multiple eyes and those extravagant horns, not to mention the fact that it's always seen standing on two legs, being much more anthropomorphic than most dragons in fantasy media. Now that I think about it, it actually looks a lot more like the old Iron King from Dark Souls 2 than a traditional dragon. The issue comes when you actually have to fight the thing, but then fight isn't quite an accurate term here, is it? Just like Demon's Souls did a version of the Hellkite Drake before it became really popular, it also did the Bed of Chaos before the Bed of Chaos. Seriously, structurally it's the same fight. There's a weak point to the right which has to be activated, and then there's a weak point to the left which must be activated, and then you head to the middle part and finish the Flaming Fiend off for good. Of course the main hazard is somewhat different in the Dragon God fight, with this being a very rare case, in fact I believe the only case of having to use stealth in a FromSoft boss fight. The Dragon God is constantly shifting its gargantuan head from side to side, meaning you must wait until it's looking away until you can move forward to another point of cover, or attempt to smash through some rubble blocking the way. In theory, it's a fine idea for a boss. Gimmicky, yes, but gimmicky doesn't have to mean bad. Sadly though, the execution of it leaves a lot to be desired. I've had runs through this game where I absolutely nail this encounter first time with zero issues, and I've had other runs where I die 15 times before nailing it. Sometimes it seems like it's perfectly safe to move, and it is safe, and then other times you'll tentatively poke your head out from behind a pillar and get obliterated by its massive fist for a one-shot KO like it's nothing, with little to no idea of what you did wrong and it's very very annoying. Even in the times when it all goes well though, the Dragon God just isn't a great boss encounter. Sure, it looks great, but it's essentially a flashy environmental hazard, not a foe that you really feel like you're truly fighting, and when you compare the mechanics of the encounter to how fearsome and massive its appearance is, the whole affair is even more disappointing. Right, now Dark Souls 1 has a much tidier selection of dragons to choose from compared to its spiritual predecessor, and some very unusual ones too. One of these is introduced in the opening cutscene in fact, that being Seath the Scaleless, the pale drake who betrayed his kin to Lord Gwyn, revealing to him the Archdragon's ultimate weakness, that being lightning. And then you've got even weirder and more monstrous varieties like the gaping dragon lurking in the depths, an abominable purple-black beast with a grotesque set of abdominal teeth. Like I said earlier, dragons are a category of being where there's a lot of room to get really creative and strange. My favourite from the game, however, is one that is a bit more traditional in its appearance, and one that makes for the most difficult dragon encounter in Dark Souls 1. It's Black Dragon Calamite. Interesting aspect of Calamite is that you're supposed to die on it the first time you get to its boss arena, by far the largest boss arena in the game too might I add. You first see the thing back in the Royal Wood though, where it makes a similar sort of appearance to the Hellkite Drake's ground quaking entrance in the Undead Burg, but its base is a deep valley featuring roaring waterfalls and lush greenery. The problem is that you can't practically get to it yet, unless you want to try and nail it with arrows and magic using much the same strategy required for the Red Dragon fight from Demon Souls, which can actually be done, and which is also a common strat for some Dark Souls speedrun categories. For most folk though, they're going to want to fight Calamite on the ground, and to force the Black Dragon to cease his endless circuits through the valley, you have to pay a visit to Hawkeye Goth for one of the sickest cutscenes of any FromSoft game.
and thus Calamit is now largely grounded, though it can still fly up to modest altitudes for certain attacks. There are a few noteworthy aspects to Calamit. For one, his eye, that glaring glowing orange eye, giving the Black Dragon a uniquely Cyclopean character. Though this is actually a slightly contentious issue. Even though it looks like he only has a single eye in the middle there, and even though the item description for the Obsidian Greatsword literally describes Calamite as a one-eyed black dragon, he does seem to have two regular eyes at the sides as well. They're just quite subtly placed. Also, to be fair, the Obsidian Greatsword item description also describes itself as a great axe, despite the fact that it's clearly not a great axe, it's a great sword. In any case, he'll use his orange eye for an absolute bollock of an attack where he lifts you up via telekinesis for a heaping helping of damage, after which you're also left with the Calamity status effect, as indicated by the orange dot above your character's head. If for some reason you find this status effect to be desirable, you can achieve the same brutal effect by wearing the Calamity ring you receive after beating the boss, which they even brought back in Dark Souls 3 for some reason. It's punishing as hell because it lasts a while, but I still like it. Well, I like the idea of it anyway, not so much when I actually get hit with it though. The eye aside though, another notable thing about Calamite is that he's a black dragon, making him appear especially dark and threatening. Though this doesn't solely apply to his scales, because even his fire has a black core, surrounded by flames of yellow, dealing both physical and magic damage. For me, Calamite's fire attacks have always been the biggest nightmare to deal with. I'm not half bad at fighting him these days, but I remember getting repeatedly scorched by his many different fire attacks, because unlike nearly every other enemy attack in the game, it's not simply a matter of dodge rolling at the correct time to avoid the flames. They linger for too long and they cover too much area, so that there's often no safe space to roll to, meaning it's all about good positioning. One thing I never got good at though was attacking its tail. This was back in the good old days where you still got rewards for cutting off the tails of dragons, a feature that I will never understand why FromSoft stop including in their games. If you cut off Calamite's tail, you get the Obsidian Greatsword, a super powerful dragon glass blade, the coloration of which kind of reminds me of Morgoth's cursed sword from Elden Ring. I'll be honest though, I have never managed to actually get this weapon because cutting off its tail is a bastard and a half. You have to bait out a certain attack, and it's really difficult and awkward, and I just can't be bothered. <laughs> Getting the Moonlight Greatsword from Seath is painful enough for me without having to go through this shit. Even so, super cool dragon which makes for a really tough fight. My pick for worst Dark Souls dragon is actually one I've already mentioned a couple of times. It's the Hellkite Drake. See, the Hellkite Drake is a dragon I tend to think quite fondly of. I remember my early Dark Souls experiences and all the terror and trepidation I had when venturing through the Undead Burg and the Undead Parish, always afraid of what sort of knight, demon or indeed dragon might lurk behind the next stony corridor. And then I met Solaire, the sunlight knight himself, gazing out wistfully at the sun and offering some kind-hearted words and offerings of assistance in battles still to come. Hey, I thought, I think everything's gonna be alright. Just need to cross this bridge here and... Oh. Cool, I guess I'll just go fuck myself then. Even though you do see this dragon near the start of the Undead Burg, this inferno still kinda comes out of nowhere, and it can be devastating, especially if you did well to get here, and especially considering that just a bit further ahead you can activate a ladder shortcut back to a previous bonfire. But... Come on, it's also pretty awesome in a sort of masochistic sense, and the sight of the drake hanging over there at the other end of the bridge is damn near iconic. The way it just looms, looking at you as if to say, what are you gonna do now, bitch? This is great and all, and it also makes for some nice memories, but my issues with the Hellkite Drake lie in when you actually try and fight the thing, because then the experience becomes awful. For a start, it's awkward as hell to try and get it to even land. I usually stand in this corner for about 20 seconds, after which it always lands down to start stomping around, but the problem is that this is a goddamn bridge with not enough room to manoeuvre, and its fire attacks cover massive ground and deal insane damage. It's very common to get one-shotted by the drake's fire even if you're somewhat beefed up with decent armour and such. Also, if it decides that it's going to fly off into the distance like it tends to do, it'll sometimes just not come back for ages. 
It looks really cool the way you can stand and watch it fly away behind that distant mountain, but I literally couldn't work out how to make it return. I ran around the bridge for several minutes, nothing. I sat at the bonfire, nothing. I quit out and then loaded my game again and nothing and then finally, just when I was about to give up, it appeared out of nowhere and one shot at me with its fucking fire breath. Damn you Hellkite Drake! Best method of killing this thing is with ranged attacks and admittedly I do really love how you can destroy its tail for the Drake sword. That's like one of those things your buddy at school tells you about and you think he must be talking shit and then you try it and it actually works. It's like the jetpack cheat from GTA San Andreas. In short, the Hellkite Drake is an iconic Dark Souls enemy, but I argue that the things that make it so iconic are largely superficial, and that those superficial elements very quickly give way to frustrating tedium and irritation if you choose to actually engage with it. I'd also like to give a brief dishonourable mention to the two undead dragons found in the Valley of the Drakes and the Painted World. They look incredible, these rotted draconic carcasses, now only possessing the upper half of their bodies with their main attack being to vomit out poisonous purple sludge, but once again actually fighting them kinda sucks. And again they can one shot you all too easily if you get caught by a melee attack. Best strategy is to just hang back and riddle their decaying flesh with a ton of arrows, which whilst being effective looks like this. Is this fun? No. Dark Souls 2 has a bit less choice than Dark Souls 1 when it comes to dragons, but there are for sure still some good ones. And not so good ones, big ones and small ones, but my pick for favourite is a rather unconventional one. I do love my dragons to come with a twist, and in this case that twist is toxic, presenting Sin, the slumbering dragon. There are a few dragons present in Dark Souls 2's base game of course, especially in the Dragon Eerie, though neither the Crown of the Old Iron King or the Crown of the Ivory King DLCs feature any dragons whatsoever, not even a little one. In the Crown of the Sunken King DLC however, we got Sin. Just like every dragon already mentioned in this list, we get a brief encounter with this one before we actually fight it, though here it's done in a really clever way, but the dragon is camouflaged in with his surroundings, with his near petrified scales blending in perfectly with the sunken stone of Shulva Sanctum City. And you can even see the point of Yorg's spear sticking out the front of its chest here, a weapon that you yourself can transpose from its soul. You catch sight of Sin once again just before entering the Dragon Sanctum where it blasts the stone bridge leading into it with a couple of green tinged fireballs and you think hurrah! This is a friendly dragon it is my friend. But that is where you'd be wrong sir, because at the base of Dragon's Rest and after defeating Alana, the squalid queen, you enter the subterranean abode of Sin Slumbering Dragon. Very cool opening moment because yet again very easy to not even notice the dragon at first but then it rises from its slumber and the fight begins. To be honest, I've always thought Sin kinda resembles Calamite a bit with the shape of its body as well as in some of its attack animations, though instead of its scales being the purest of wax, it appears to be made of stone. In fact, the stone element doesn't even stop there because it's tied into the boss fight. Weapons will actually deteriorate at 1.5 times the normal rate when Sin is struck, meaning that fragile weapons such as katanas are a very risky proposition, at least unless you've brought along a bracing knuckle ring and a few repair powders. I really appreciate that as a boss feature, but my favourite thing about Sin is his particular element, that being poison, or more specifically, toxic. Calumet had his dark infused flames, sure, and that was great, yes. But bear in mind that even though Dark Souls 1's DLC introduced dark magic, dark damage wasn't actually a damage type in that game. There was just fire, lightning and magic. And so for as sick as it is, Calumet's dark theme was more just a super cool visual effect. With Sin though, I love the idea of its very breath being infused with toxic, to the extent that some attacks even leave behind toxic fumes to be avoided until they disperse. Not entirely unlike what we'd later see in Elden Ring with Fortisax's death blight, though it's much easier to avoid here. Only things I don't so much like about Sin is that even though you can cut its tail off and it's satisfying as hell, you get no reward to speak of. Once again from Soft, I ask, why not? And secondly, it'll sometimes fly around way too much, to the point where you can go a damn minute without getting much of a chance to actually deal any damage. It's the same sort of issue that the Guardian Dragon boss has. All in all, Sin is hands down the sickest dragon in Dark Souls 2 and a damn good boss. 
Not quite a great boss, and not quite one of the greatest dragon bosses, but a damn good one nonetheless. In last place, I've got the Ancient Dragon. It's a damn shame too, because this should have been one of the greats. It should have been one of those we'd all look back on and think, God damn, that was a great boss. But it wasn't. The lead up to it is stellar. You first fight through the Dragon Eerie, which is itself a bloody good level, and one of the most beautiful in the game too, itself featuring a few decent enough dragon fights. And then you fight through the Dragon Shrine, which I also consider to be a pretty great level, with amazing enemies. The Drake Keepers are imposing as hell, and the Dragon Knights are slick as hell. Things can get hectic as hell though, if you mess up and they all start attacking you. But it's all good because you're ascending higher and higher up the shrine for an audience with the Ancient Dragon. Not only the biggest dragon in the game, but the single biggest dragon from the Dark Souls trilogy, I think. Totally optional fight of course, its main purpose here is to grant you the Ashen Mist Heart, which you can get simply by talking to it, but if you whack it a bit, after enough whacks it'll get mad, and thus does the fight commence. Unfortunately though, there are two glaring problems with the Ancient Dragon fight, both of which are connected. 1. The fight is really, really boring, and 2. The Ancient Dragon is way too easy to manipulate. Whenever I fight it, I always bait out its forward fire breath attack, and then run in to attack a leg until it starts gearing up for its next attack, at which point I run away, knowing that the dragon will always fly directly up for its big AoE fire breath attack. When it lands, it will always be facing directly towards me, allowing me to once again bait out its forward fire breath attack. And that's the cycle to be repeated until its enormous health bar is done. It works 100% of the time, and it is extremely tedious. Yes, the ancient dragon looks awesome, and I love this massive circular arena at the top of this ancient shrine, and yes, if you do get tagged by its flames, it's going to do a lot of damage, but even so, this is not a good battle. It's way more boring than it should have been, and I don't like it very much. I will also give a brief dishonourable mention to that horrible dragon they placed in Hyde's Tower of Flame in the score of the first Sin edition of the game. Same enemy type you see throughout the Dragon Eerie where they're pretty good fun to fight, but I've always detested the placement of this one. It's all good if you've got a bow, but if you're a melee focused player and you're a bit too slow to get over to its platform, it can easily result in an infuriating loop where it's nearly impossible to get to it due to it spamming its fire breath. And even if you do make it over there, you can easily get cooked by its AoE fire breath attack. And hopefully you didn't kill the Dragon Rider before facing it, because if you die, have fun fighting through hordes of both old knights and hide knights on every fucking attempt. Grrr, now I'm mad. On to Dark Souls 3. Now as far as selection goes, Dark Souls 3 does not have all that much, though a low reason for this is that due to the extent to which the world has stagnated thanks to the continuous linking of the fire, just as with the demons, almost all the dragons have simply died out. In fact, the ones you see in the high wall of Lothric and Lothric Castle aren't even true dragons at all. They're actually pus of man entities that are possessing and controlling the bodies of dragons, and as such, you can permanently kill them by destroying these writhing, parasitic beings of the abyss. You've also got the monstrosity that is King Asyros, who shares a likeness with Seath with his pale, scaleless flesh though he is far more grotesque and broken looking than Seath ever was, to the extent that he doesn't even seem to have any eyes. Super disturbing design. Thankfully though, with the coming of the Ringed City DLC, a very special dragon indeed was introduced to Dark Souls 3. In fact, he's easily the best dragon of any Souls game. It's Dark Eater Medik, uh, Medir, sorry. Yet again, this is a dragon that we see before we get to fight. We first hear of Medir from Shira, Knight of Filianor, who speaks to us from behind a door at the top of the stairs which lead down into the swamp. Not really the most convenient place for a chat, to be honest, with all the Harald knights stomping about, but regardless, she asks the player to put an end to Medir, a descendant of the arch dragons who was tasked with the role of fighting and eating the dark wherever he found it. However, just like any man, woman, or indeed dragon who goes against the dark, Medir eventually became corrupted and frenzied by it, turning from an ally of the gods into an abyss-infected fiend, and being made all the more destructive and explosive for it. 
The first time you need to contend with him is directly after the swamp where once again we get a play on the old having to time when you run so you don't get obliterated by the dragon fire routine, though there are side alcoves where you can take shelter from the flames. The next time you see Medir though, it is an actual fight. Not a boss fight just yet, but certainly a battle, and it can be a pretty brutal one too. In fact, it's essentially like a way tighter version of the undead dragon encounters from Dark Souls 1, only instead of dodging purple vomit, you're dodging purple lasers. This encounter does give you a great opportunity to take in the Dark Eater's appearance though, showing the extent to which much of his flesh is hardened and crystallised, and the way his wings are tattered with a dark purple aura emanating from them. After dealing enough damage, you can deal a critical hit to Medir's head, knocking him down into the black chasm far below, though as indicated by the fact that he still has a wee bit of health remaining here and when you see that you get no soul or item reward, the dragon is not yet dead. Indeed, later on once you find the secret entrance to his lair, that being through the floor of a small chapel, Medir can be challenged for real, and he without a doubt makes for the toughest fiercest and most violent dragon fight in Dark Souls. This motherfucker puts the ancient dragon to shame. Shame on you ancient dragon. The dark element really comes through in this fight too. You can really feel the extent to which this dragon has been infused and corrupted by it, and like Calamite, its flames have a strong black tinge to them. Madeir's attacks have a distinct violence and ferocity to them which I find to be uniquely intimidating, so much so that I literally gave up on fighting him at one point. I'd already beaten every other boss from the Dark Souls trilogy by the time I got to Madeir the first time I was playing through the Ring City DLC, but for the life of me, I could not beat him, as in, I couldn't even get close. I kept getting cooked by his flames, and I found it super difficult to deal any proper bloody damage, and that laser attack, holy shit, one of the coolest looking attacks from any of these games for sure, and absolutely made to evoke frantic, panicked button mashing, especially the very first time you see it, but my god can it be a real round ender. I did eventually come back to Madeir though and had a way easier time of it. Just like with any good dragon fight, positioning is very important to avoid its dragon fire, and I often found it safer to linger near the dragon's head to bait out favourable attacks, and so that I had a clear view of what he was going to do next. Furthermore, if you concentrate your attacks on Medir's head rather than his legs, he will stagger after losing around 70% of his HP, allowing for a massively damaging critical hit that is satisfying as hell to pull off. Incredible boss and a top tier dragon. In fact, Medir's the best dragon on the list. So far. As for worst Dark Souls 3 dragon, well I guess I could choose the aforementioned Puss of Man wyverns from Lothric, but to be honest, I kind of really like the way they're handled. I love the idea of these draconic corpses being controlled by these things, and how you have to flank the dragons to get to the Puss of Man, and then try and take them out without getting cursed, which is pretty tough. Thus, I'm not going to choose these things. What I'm going to choose is the Arch Dragon Peak Wyvern. Not the ancient Wyvern who you fight as a boss, mind, but the one you fight as a mini boss of sorts at around the midpoint through the level. It's an easy one to forget about too, in fact, I nearly forgot about it myself when making my picks for each game, but then once I remembered it, I fired the game back up again to fight it, and yes, this dragon kind of blows. A lot of people consider the ancient wyvern boss to be one of the worst in all of Soulsborne, but personally I've always kinda liked it. It's a gimmick type encounter where the wyvern functions more like an environmental hazard than an actual enemy to be engaged with, but I like the idea of having to flee and evade this stalking draconic menace before lining up your headshot for the coup de grace. Mind you, you technically can fight it as you would any other enemy if you really want, but the problem is that it absolutely sucks to do that and is not fun, and it has way too much health, and you don't get any special reward for being it this way, so why bother? Which brings us to the wyvern enemy found later on in the level, just past those infernal rock lizards. As far as I can tell, this is the same enemy model as the Ancient Wyvern, except it's scaled down in size and you cannot hit it with a devastating critical for a one hit KO, meaning it has to be fought conventionally, and it's just not fun. Even though it's not an actual boss fight, it still has a ton of HP, and all of its attacks are the most basic run of the mill dragon attacks possible. 
Think back to those dragons from the Dragon Eerie in Dark Souls 2. Well, this thing's just that, but with way more HP to the point of tedium, and also, this makes for kind of an awkward space to actually fight the thing. It's not really that difficult to beat, and its fire attacks aren't very difficult to avoid, but honestly, more than anything it reminded me of a slightly less shitty version of the Ancient Dragon. The reward for its defeat is pretty decent I guess, you get a bunch of titanite, but even so, very low tier dragon fight. Now, I'll be honest, when I first had the idea for this video, I initially thought, shit, Bloodborne doesn't have any dragons, and nor does Sekiro, there are no dragons in Japan, everyone knows that. But then I remembered that there sure as shit is a dragon in Sekiro, and what's more is that it makes for the most beautiful and emotional fight in the entire game. It's the Divine Dragon. Wolf is sent off to the Divine Realm in search of tears of the Divine Dragon, but rather than this being in any sort of spiritual sense, he literally does need some dragon tears, all to go towards severing the Divine Heir's immortality. It's a hell of a damn journey to get there too, first requiring Wolf to ascend to Fountainhead Palace from the Palanquin beyond where he fought the corrupted monk apparition via the gnarly looking rope puppet thing. Then, at the very end of the palace, after fighting through a legion of Okami warriors, palace nobles, and after dodging bolts of lightning while sprinting through a sequence of Torre gates, we come across the preserved body of Tomoe, leaning against a rock, at which point Wolf clasps his hands in prayer before being transported to the Divine Realm. It kinda reminds me of when we travel over to Archdragon Peak in Dark Souls 3, where we don't seem to travel there physically, but by the spirit or mind. The whole encounter with the Divine Dragon truly is a visual and musical feast. Although you can die to it, certainly, it's clearly not meant to be especially challenging, and to me, the fight with the Divine Dragon is more of an experience than any sort of conventional fight. Only at the very end do you even make physical contact with it, with your primary means of delivering damage beforehand coming from projectiles of divine lightning from the strange tree root grappling points which emerge from the cloud obscured ground, at least if you've managed to dodge or deflect the dragon's vertical and horizontal slashes. The track that plays here is not only the greatest in the game, but one of the greatest of any FromSoft game. And then just as Wolf gets blown away after doing enough damage, the soundtrack blows you away even more, upping the sonic power and emotional intensity to heavenly levels, as you desperately try to fight your way forward to the dragon as it desperately throws every last attack at you before Wolf is finally propelled higher than ever before for one final bolt of divine lightning, after which all that's left to do is to collect your gracious gift of tears, and then leave this higher being in peace. Well, maybe I'm cheating a bit here, but there's really only one other thing in Sekiro which resembles a dragon, and it's the old dragons of the tree which you need to fight directly before getting to face off against the divine dragon, though apparently their name in Japanese directly translates to white wooden old men. Hmm. One thing is for sure, these are some bizarre looking dragons. I remember the very first time I entered the Divine Realm and saw one of these things appear in the cutscene, and I initially thought that this was the Divine Dragon that the game had been hyping up, and I felt confused, kind of disappointed, and a little bit disgusted. They do have long necks and antlers like the Divine Dragon, but that's about where the similarities end. Their facial features are grotesque, possessing uncanny human expressions that just don't look right at the end of these weird wooden bodies, in the same way that the placement of Rykard's face on the god-devouring serpent looks wrong as hell. Furthermore, one of the main ways these things deal damage to you is by coughing up clouds of noxious green gas, and even the tree bark they appear to be composed of is tinged with a sickly green. Of course, the old dragons of the tree aren't intended to be any sort of real challenge themselves, but rather they are simply precursors to the battle with the glorious being that immediately follows. Ugly where the divine dragon is beautiful, dull where it is incandescent, 
and sickly where it is powerful. It's something of a gimmick fight too. You can kill them one by one and it's not too difficult either, but if you wait for a tree root to appear out of the ground, you can dispatch scores of them at a time with a unique aerial death blow. It's actually pretty damn satisfying. Though, if you do die to the Divine Dragon, it can be a bit annoying to have to go through it all again every time. Not a terrible encounter or anything, but yeah, I guess collectively these things are the worst dragon in Sekiro, if indeed they are dragons, which for the purposes of this video, they are. On to Elden Ring. Oh my god, we have arrived. The draconic pickings were a wee bit slim for a couple of the previously mentioned games, but by golly Elden Ring more than makes up for it. There are loads of dragons stomping and flying around the lands between, and a whole bunch of them are very, very sick. This game went balls to the damn wall with its draconic offerings. You've got dragons who breathe fire, glintstone, frost, rot, and even death. You've got lesser dragons, named dragons, ancient dragons, dream dragons, magma worms, and even dragonkin soldiers, shambling imitations of true dragons, though they are also one of the very few foes in the game capable of using ice lightning, which as well as dealing damage, also causes frost buildup, much like the ghost flame used by deathrite birds. Undoubtedly there is an awesome selection of savage dragons to choose from, but look, before I even started putting together my list for each game, I already knew which one I'd be picking for Elden Ring. The game was rigged right from the start. Of course, I am choosing the Dragon Lord himself, Placidus Axe. I'm sure I was not alone in completely missing Placidus Axe on my first playthrough, and no bloody wonder when you consider how absurdly tucked away he is. You really need to have been exploring thoroughly to notice the rock path that you can drop down to, one that initially seems to end in nothing, though it does give you a close-up view of this tornado. Anyone else find these things absolutely terrifying to look at? Seriously, it literally makes me physically uncomfortable to stand and look at the tornadoes in Faramazoa. I love it. But with Faramazua being the strange place that it is, this far-flung anomalous enigma in defiance of the laws of gravity and chronology, time itself seems to slow, halt and then reverse, as we are transported to a vast colosseum, a literal arena, home to the strangest, most ancient and most powerful dragon of them all, Placidisax, who is not stalking around or flying about, but rather is simply floating there silently and ominously, only unfurling his ancient stony wings upon your approach. In fact, this boss's name is literally a combination of two Latin words, with Placidus meaning calm or mild, and Saxum referring to a large stone or rock. Indeed, Placidisax truly does look so old that his scales have begun turning to stone, with some being coloured white and others being coloured gold. And these colours are actually represented by the white-coloured sombre ancient dragon smithing stone and the golden ancient dragon smithing stone, with both these upgrade materials being literal scales from Placidisax, who was said to have been Elden Lord even before the age of the Air Tree, or so the item description for his remembrance claims, contradicting the in-game belief that Godfrey was the first Elden Lord. By the time we encounter Placidus Axe, he only has two heads remaining, though he's depicted as having had four on the old Lord's talisman. The dragon's Hydra-esque head situation is just one of several physical aspects that set it apart from later dragons though, with the most striking being the colour of his fire breath, which instead of being yellow or red, is a bright gold. In fact, the only other being in the game capable of breathing golden fire is the equally mysterious Elden Beast. One thing the Elden Beast cannot do, however, is the Placidus Axe's Ruin attack, which is essentially a doubled-up golden version of Medir's Dark Beam, and which looks just as, if not more, incredible and difficult to avoid. Like the game's other ancient dragons, this boss also uses Red Lightning, being capable of calling it forth with a skyward roar, but as well as this, it also has the Bolt of Placidus Axe attack, generating a spectral spear of red lightning within his hand, before detonating it after a brief hush in the music to build the dread and anticipation for the coming Crimson Blast. The form of the bolt actually looks pretty much identical to the bolt of Grand Sax in Lanedale, which also happens to be the very weapon I was using in this here footage. Nice. 
One physical aspect of Placidisax that is totally unique to it though is his ability to convert himself into cloud form, dematerializing his physical body and then rematerializing it as a storm cloud before heaving his vast craggy form back down at the player for several assaults from spectral claws composed of red lightning. I know a lot of people consider Dark Eater Medir to be FromSoft's greatest ever dragon, and no wonder, he's a beast. But for me, the title of Lord of Dragons has to go to the Dragon Lord. He's just so mysterious with such an unconventional design. We've had several freakishly unconventional dragon designs in FromSoft games, but Placidisax is unconventional in a different way. He doesn't look grotesque and rotten, or even radiant and beautiful, but rather, he looks infinitely ancient and is, in my eyes, infinitely awesome, and the best dragon on this list. I'm not sure if FromSoft are ever going to top Placidisax, but I am excited to see them try. Right, now I have to say that of any of the games covered thus far, Elden Ring is where I had the most difficult time picking a worst dragon, because I really don't think there are any truly bad ones. One broad critique you could certainly make is that, for all the dragons there are in the game, many of them are largely the same, but with slightly different visual designs and with one element exchanged for another. Aguil, Grail, Smarag, Exsykes, Borealis and Adua really aren't all that different, and then Fortisax, Lanziax and the various unnamed ancient dragons found throughout Faram Azua are also all based on one another. But even so, I don't give a shit, I still like them and I love their different visual designs. I still keenly remember that moment where I first came across decaying Exsykes in the middle of Caelid only for it to start spewing clouds of scarlet rot at me. That shit is gnarly. And guess what? I think Magma Worms and the Dragonkin are extremely cool too, though I wouldn't be so bold as to count Dragonkin as proper dragons to be counted here. The lore behind them is literally that they are not and can never be true dragons. Otherwise, I guess I'd have picked those obnoxious phantom ones that appear in the consecrated snowfields. And so, I guess if I'm picking the worst dragon in Elden Ring, I'm going to have to go with Elder Dragon Grail, found in Caelid just by Fort Faroth. Just as you'd expect an Elder Dragon to be, Grail is absolutely massive. In fact, she's the single largest living dragon in Elden Ring, though she is far smaller than the corpse of Gransax over in Landale, who completely dwarfs any other FromSoft dragon. Imagine having to fight this thing as a boss. The sad aspect of Grail, however, is that she has been completely ravaged by the Scarlet Rot, to the extent that she seems to be held in place by these horrid fungus-like growths that are so common in Caelid, rendering her immobile. There are, however, five lesser dragons surrounding Grail, who she's effectively possessing, as indicated by their glowing red eyes, and by the fact that for each one defeated, she loses 20% of her max HP. And by the way, she has a lot of bloody HP. Speaking of blood, that brings us to another popular way to kill her, that being to just bring a bleed weapon and hack at her tail, dealing massive damage with every successful bleed buildup. In fact, until, like, yesterday, I thought this was how you were supposed to kill her. I didn't even realise that her health was connected to these lesser dragons. To be clear, I don't actually consider this to be a bad encounter. Yes, Grail makes for a pretty poor dragon in this sorry state, but that's literally the damn point. She's this massive creature whose head is about 20 times the size of your horse, cow, who by rights should be one of the most mighty beings still living in the lands between and yet she's been reduced to this sorry state. It's pretty sad, and I always feel kinda bad after I kill her, and that we didn't get to see this Elder Dragon in her prime. And there you have it folks, there is my list. Dragons tend to make for some of the most memorable and visually impressive enemies in FromSoft's games, and it was great fun talking about all my favourites here, as well as my least favourites. Hopefully we'll see many more dragons from FromSoft in the future. I certainly hope we'll see a few more in the DLC to Elden Ring, though, like I said, I'm not sure they will ever top Placidisax. Please allow me to give my superb patrons a final thank you for supporting the channel, and on that note, Cheers for watching and cheerio.